Good morning. Welcome to Age Positive 2020 Revision. And I'm assuming that you can hear me, so someone let me know if, if not. My name is Kathy boyer Shessel. I'm Project Manager for KC Communities for All Ages as an initiative at Mid-America Regional Council and a member of the Conference Planning Committee. Welcome back to those of you who have attended our previous in-person Age Positive Conferences at Kauffman Conference Center. And welcome to those who are new to Age Positive. I had a chance to look at the roster last night and see that we have attendees from not only Kansas and Missouri, but Illinois and New Jersey and even the West Coast. So one of the beauties of uh, a virtual um, training is that we can attract such a larger audience. So welcome to everyone. Our in-person conference theme when we had the conference scheduled last May was 2020 vision. Kind of ironic when you think about that. However, due to the pandemic, we pivoted from an in-person conference to the six-session virtual conference with a new title, 2020 Revision. We also narrowed the focus to social isolation and loneliness. While many of you on this call are aware that social isolation and loneliness for older adults has been a concern for really a very, very long time for those of us in this field. Since COVID-19, it's likely most and maybe many on this call or on this session now know from personal experience what it means to feel socially isolated and maybe even lonely since over the last several months, we've been hunkered down in our homes, either by ourselves or with others, if we're fortunate. This has given us a deeper understanding of the importance of creating new opportunities to connect older adults to family, friends, communities, organizations, and just the broader world. Over the next three days, we'll hear from experts in our field on the prevalence and impact of social isolation and loneliness, evidence-based programs to, uh, to address this issue, uh, examples of local programs that have been developed and pivoted um, so that these, so these experiences can be brought to older adults in their homes. And we'll also learn on Friday, our final session, a focus on how to reframe aging. Unfortunately, one of the impacts of the pandemic has put a spotlight on ageism. Um, and how that has negative impacts on how we view older adults. So that session, Reframing Aging, aging will help us develop new skills to reframe aging. The presenters for Age Positive 2020 Revision are outstanding, and I hope that your schedule will allow, us, allow you to participate in all six sessions. Next slide, please. Age Positive is organized by representatives from several regional nonprofits that care deeply about the quality of life for older adults. You can see the names or the logos on the screen. It is through the efforts of, these, of this partnership and this group that Age Positive Conferences are made available to us. Before introducing Kathy Greenlee, our opening keynote speaker, there are just a few housekeeping items. So yes, even virtual um, trainings have housekeeping items, so bear with me. All participants will be muted and cameras turned off during the presentation, but we still want you to be engaged and so therefore that's why we have chat. If you're new to Zoom, please click on the click or tap on your screen and you will see a menu appear at the bottom. And one of the reasons that we're going through this is for those of you on this call that have pivoted to offer virtual trainings, if there's one thing that we've learned, it's really important that we level the playing field and everyone be comfortable with the technology that's offered. And since chat is going to be our primary way to interact with each other this morning, um, we're going to go through um, the, the part about chat in case this is new to you. So once you click or tap on the screen, you'll see the chat as one of the menu items down below. Click on that and the chat window will magically appear on your right. And, I, and you probably are seeing that the chat has been pretty active all morning. Um, so this is where you will enter your questions and we hope that you'll chat with one another as well. But we do hope that there'll be time for questions for Kathy following her presentation. So please enter your questions for Kathy in the type message here at the bottom of the chat window. 
I'll be monitoring the questions and pull those out from the normal chat and I'll relay these to Kathy after her presentation. But please also use the chat to enter your comments. It's going to be very important over the next three days that we learn and share from each other. The presentation will be recorded. The recording and PowerPoint will be made available within two weeks following the conference, and an email will be sent to everyone so that you know when these are available on the conference website. It's important to note that Mark's Zoom account is HIPAA protected or HIPAA compliant. So that for the purposes of this conference, it means that you're not going to be able to cut or copy and paste like you probably do in other um, sessions. So if you see something in chat that you want to keep, you'll need to write it down, take a screenshot maybe, or conjure up some of your own magic to, um, to retrieve and keep the information that you feel is important. So now it is my honor to and pleasure to introduce Kathy Greenlee, H-Positive's 2020 Revisions keynote speaker. Many, if not most of you, already know Kathy. Um, she's the former, she formerly served as Assistant Secretary of Aging at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, a position to which she was appointed by President Obama. Prior to that position, Kathy served for 18 years in Kansas State Government, including her final position as Kansas Secretary of Aging. Currently, Kathy is president and CEO of Greenlee Global LLC and works with the state of Kansas as the Kansas COVID-19 Long-Term Services and Sports Supports Liaison. Welcome, Kathy Greenlee, who will speak to us on social isolation by default and design. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Kathy, before I get started, just on behalf of everybody I can see on the participant list, I just want to thank you and your committee for retooling. Uh, we would all rather be at the Kauffman Center this morning, and this has been quite a bit of work for you all to figure out uh, how best to convene us now. So uh, as one of the speakers, I just want to say thank you uh, for the effort that it's taken to put this together for you, your team at Mark, um, and, and the broader planning committee. Uh, as Kathy said, when she first asked me to talk about social isolation, this was pre-pandemic. It was months and months and months ago. Uh, so the importance of this keynote has really changed and become even more significant uh, now. So, um, Carmela, let's start with my first slide. Carmela is going to advance my slides for me. So I want to just jump in um, and acknowledge that I have done hundreds of, of public presentations. Uh, this is a new experience for all of us, for me as a presenter, uh, for those of us who present, uh, and, and people who listen in online. I need to rely on slides. I've put some questions in so I can get some uh, reaction from you. And as Kathy said, she's going to monitor the chat as we go. So hopefully we can make this as interactive, uh, if that's possible in this kind of a format. Where my title comes from, um, by default and design, really is that we already knew that social isolation was bad. That's why social isolation had been already identified as the topic for my keynote this morning. We knew it was bad. Uh, we've proved it was bad, which I will talk about um, during my presentation. And Emily Allen will talk about uh, later this morning. We can tell you and show you why social isolation is bad. And now, unfortunately, we're forced to socially isolate because of the pandemic. So it's really um, this sort of convergence of strangeness in some ways that the thing that we know is so bad for older people and individuals uh, writ large is now uh, what keeps us all safe. So we have to kind of manage how to be safe and how to continue to combat this issue um, that we've known about for so long. Uh, next slide, please. Carmelia, are you doing my slides? Mm -hmm. Kathy, can you help me out? Well, I'm going to keep talking. I'm not quite sure where the slides are. So um, I'm just going to keep going and 
If I don't know, I will send Kathy a text. I want to start and read you a story. And maybe we can figure out what's going on with slides. Um, hang on just a sec. In case they're trying to reach me. Um, I'm going to read you a story uh, beginning from a book called What Are Old People For? Here's the book. It will show up eventually on my slides. It's by Dr. Bill Thomas, who's well known. He's someone that I know. I had him um, come to Kansas many years ago when I was secretary to do a presentation. So I'm going to read a, um, a, a brief section uh, at the beginning of one of his chapters. It's called The Three Plagues. And again, this is in Dr. Bill Thomas's words, not my own. In the early 1990s, I took a job as a physician in a small nursing home in upstate New York. The facility had a proud history of compliance with state and federal regulations and was in every way a credit to the community. At one point, it boasted, yeah, they're working on this. At one point, it boasted five consecutive perfect state inspection surveys. It had everything such a facility could ask for, a modern, well-maintained building, a thoughtful and committed board of directors, and a dedicated staff and management team, many with long tenures. There were just three problems at the nursing home. There we go. Loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. My eyes were open to these plagues one day when I was asked to see a woman about a rash that had developed on her arm. Accompanied by a nurse, I strode down the hallway, confident that I could diagnose the cause of the inflammation. I found my patient lying in her bed in the very sparely furnished room that she shared with another resident. I pulled the curtain aside and presented myself in what I supposed was a very friendly, confident way. In a too loud voice, I questioned her about the red splotches on her arm, how long they'd been there, whether they itched, and if ever she'd had such a rash in the past. When I prepared to leave, she reached up and took hold of my arm and pulled me toward her. I will never forget the whiteness of her hair and the blueness of her eyes. In a soft, sad voice, she said, I'm so lonely. At first, I could not answer. Nothing in my training or experience had prepared me for this. I clumsily excused myself and staggered back to the nurse's station. There I wrote a medical note documenting my visit and prescribing the appropriate cream. I finished my rounds and left the facility, but those eyes, that face, that voice would not leave my mind. Indeed, they are with me still, even to this day. So I wanted to start with this particular story about things that we already know, uh, things that I think are captured well in Dr. Thomas's story. Um, let's see how we're doing. Can we advance my slide now, Carmelia? From this, Dr. Thomas formed um, a company called the Eden Alternative. Um, I mentioned that in case you all have heard of it. Next slide, please. And he really talks about, um, in this book, what are old people for? These three things, and I know um, you're not supposed to read from slide, but these are worth reading. That a lonely person needs companionship the way a thirsty person needs water. It's an essential ingredient of well-being. That nursing homes are academies of helplessness. The buildings themselves actually disable the people who live there. That boredom is a crushing weight that can squeeze the life out of any human being. It's a pain we suffer when we seek but cannot find variety and spontaneity in daily life. Next slide. To overcome those three problems by way of um, the Eden alternative that he set up, Dr. Thomas founded the Greenhouse Project, which I, I imagine many people on this, um, on this call this morning, on this webinar this morning, are familiar with. And it really was to combat those three plagues. And in reading about helplessness, there's a good thing to keep in mind that's very specific that actually will apply throughout as we talk about um, this, this topic um, the rest of this hour. That in a big nursing home, in a, in a nursing home with long halls, in order to get everybody down to the, um, to the lunchroom for any meal or down to the dining room, uh, it often required staff to put older people, nursing home residents in wheelchairs to move them down the hall. The very act of putting someone in a wheelchair makes it 
easier for them to lose the ability to ambulate uh, because they're no longer exercising, that the walk to lunch is an exercise. Uh, that's what Dr. Thomas is talking about in terms of helplessness. And he really put this model together as a way to deal with those three plagues, all of them. Uh, in these smaller nursing home models, uh, engaging the staff around a central kitchen with the residents, cooking, um, making cookies. I mean, it's all designed to over overcome those three problems. It'll be interesting as we move through the pandemic, which will um, eventually, thank God, someday be over. Uh, as we talk about the future of nursing homes, keep an eye on this particular concept, if not the model as it's branded, at least the model as it's designed, that uh, it may be that the better place to be for older people is in smaller facilities, both for quality of life, which is what this is really talking about, as well as for quality of care, given what we see happening in nursing homes uh, through the pandemic. Let's go to the next slide. So when I went to Washington, like I mentioned, I had met Dr. Thomas. He, I'd had him come to Kansas to do a presentation. When I went to Washington and started working as Assistant Secretary for Aging, I had an, a eureka moment. And so I, I called Dr. Thomas or I emailed him. And I realized that these three plagues are ubiquitous. That his story about the woman with the rash and that setting and his creation of the greenhouse movement uh, was reflective of his experience in a nursing home. But this is really broader than that. That loneliness, helplessness, and boredom are part of aging. That these are deep problems that, that impact um, all people, or many people, I guess I should say, who are older. And I think we need to think about what role ageism plays. But look at the policies that we have in place, the challenges that we have with something like transportation, uh, how that makes it harder uh, to approach the three plagues. Uh, that this is a nursing home story, but it's really a problem about aging and ageism and the structural problems that we have. Uh, I think you have to be a certain age or certainly be in the field um, before you ask yourself, what, what do old people do all day? Um, how do they spend their time? Um, most of us who are working can't wait to have uh, what seems like, like much less to do all day. But really, what do you do all day when you're 90? Um, these problems uh, really continue uh, to plague us and need to be addressed. Next, next slide. Older people feel dismissed. Society stops expecting anything from the old. Uh, in my career in the field now uh, of aging, which has, uh, has taken many different forms, uh, I've read about ageism. I've, I'm familiar with the Frameworks Project that um, I was gonna talk about reframing aging. Uh, one of my favorite kind of descriptions of ageism is that society stops expecting anything from older people. We dismiss older people. Older people feel that. You've retired now, you can go. And this is framed as, you know, go play. But it's really hard for, no, for older people when nothing is expected of them. They're not expected to contribute. And we also don't have developmental milestones. Um, our son-in-law, when our grandkids were young, posted one of those um, developmental milestone charts for children on the fridge. Like, at, you know, at age 10, you should know how to mow the yard. At age 12, you should fix a meal. We don't have developmental milestones for older people. I wish that we could develop some that dealt with, um, frankly, uh, advanced care planning. That by, by the age of 80, you need a plan. By the age of 75, uh, you need to know where you'll live. I mean, we don't have developmental milestones. We do celebrate birthdays, and perhaps because there are no other sort of achievement milestones, and growing older is a significant achievement, uh, it makes it even more important that we stop and recognize these milestones. Some of the milestones uh, are positive, you know, turning 95. I talked to someone last week whose mother was 104. Some are negative. Um, Dr. Thomas has written um, several books, and what I like about um, his writing and thinking is he makes me think. And he has um, a, a different book, I think it's the one called The Second Wind, when he talks about the use of the word still. And he calls this word completely, I don't remember how he characterized it, it's a, it's a diminutive, diminutive word, uh, it's a negative word. 
uh, it characterizes that when you say someone can still do something, that they're still worthy. Uh, he still plays tennis. Well, what if he can't? She still drives. That in talking about advancing age, most everyone at some point will retire from driving. Most everyone at some point will have a physical, if not a mental, decline. And by continuing to use this word, it's a way to hearken back to a different time of adulthood that we stand up as being better. Uh, and we should all consider our use of this language as another way to reinforce that the things that are coming, the other milestones that are happening uh, and passage of time are completely negative. Um, next slide, please. So I told you I want to um, ask you some questions. So we're gonna try this technology. Uh, the first one, and I think um, Carmelia said she's gonna pop in. I think I've got three questions, um, all three at once. I want you to answer this question first. If you think about the older adults you know or serve, or if you yourself are an older adult, which of these three plagues do you see most often? Loneliness, helplessness, or boredom? So we're gonna see if we can um, if Carmelo can do a poll, because it's going to have, it's going to be hard for me to have you raise your hands. So, um, Kathy, we are having some issues with the polling right now. So, um, okay. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, you all keep answering. I'm going to, I'm going to take the time to read through the chat because I can tell that loneliness is the overwhelming winner. Boredom, Got a few people, um, helplessness, loneliness, some boredom. That's probably how, if you all, you all can sc scroll through your chat as well, that, that this sense of loneliness is, is, is crippling uh, or disabling for, for people. And we all see it. Um, I was glad I got through reading that section um, from Dr. Thomas's book without crying, because I do that more now. Uh, because it's so sad to me that people uh, are lonely. It, it, really, it really breaks my heart. Uh, I assume that's shared by all of us uh, since we work in this field and, and know and love older people. Uh, okay, thank you all for dropping that in the chat. I have another couple of questions in a little bit. So, uh, Camarilla, Camarilla, I, Camarilla, I can say your name. Let me close this out. <clears throat> so I want to move and talk then a little bit more about um, social isolation, and loneliness specifically. They're different, but they're related terms. This picture that I um, put in here is a consensus study report, and you can see at the top, it's from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Now, a consensus study group is a big deal group. Um, the National Academies have different types of projects. I'm on a smaller committee that's a forum on aging, disability, and independence, but a consensus study group is that. I mean, they really look at the state of the work and the science on a particular topic. I was very interested when I saw that AARP Foundation had sponsored this effort uh, for the National Academies to look at social isolation and loneliness in older adults. I, uh, frankly, wanted to get on the committee and I wasn't selected. I thought I was pretty qualified, but they were looking for clinicians and people who could really look at the healthcare impacts of social isolation and loneliness. And this report is like 250, 260 pages long. It really goes through the details of um, kind of the impacts of social isolation and loneliness. And it was, it was published at the very beginning of the pandemic. The timing of this publication is uncanny. I think it was like the 27th or 28th of February. I know it was the end of February uh, when they had the big rollout and publication of this report. So the timing um, could not be better for, for all of us to kind of take what's happening because of the pandemic and couple it with what we've now learned uh, about the, the health and the kind of the science behind these two problems uh, to grab hold of both of these things together to try to figure out how to help people now and how to, how to change social programming, I think, in the future. These are two slightly different terms. Social isolation is the objective state of having few social relationships. 
Loneliness is a subjective feeling of being isolated. So you could, you could have um, a lot of people around you and still feel lonely. You could have fewer people around you and really not feel lonely at all, but also be socially isolated. So they're slightly different. In the um, Three Plagues conversation, Dr. Thomas has talked mostly about loneliness. Um, they are not interchangeable, they are related. I will hear and have been talking really about both. Um, I, I had mentioned that Emily from AARP Foundation uh, is going to spend more time going through this report, but I've got a couple more slides to talk about what the report findings were. So next slide, please. So according to this National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine report, 24% of community dwelling adults 65 and older are considered socially isolated. A third of them, and again, this is before, it'd be interesting to see this, these numbers now, of course, be like 100%, 35% of adults 45 plus feel, feel isolated. And that's interesting because it drops down to the age of 45 at this point, and it's a third of all people feel lonely. 43% of people older than 60 feel lonely. Uh, and again, this is from research that would have taken place primarily in 2019 based on literature review and science that, that goes back uh, well before uh, we started in this pandemic. Okay, next slide. The there are risk factors for both social isolation and loneliness. These are risk factors that you all will be familiar with and it was clear as you dropped comments into the chat, how many of you have seen these three plagues, certainly loneliness that uh, we can focus on in addition to social isolation, that you have seen these and these risk factors are not surprises to us, that living alone is a risk factor. I believe it's also a risk factor, and I point this out because I do a lot of work around the topic of elder abuse, that when an older person moves in with a family member, older person moves in with daughter or son, even though they're not living alone, they lose social connections and may continue to feel uh, or be socially isolated uh, and lonely, even though they're living with other people. Older people lose their families and friends. They outlive, someone described it to me one time as they outlive their life, uh, especially the very old, where um, many of their friends, certainly their family uh, of the same age or older, have all, have all died. Um, that these are risk factors. Chronic illness is a risk factor for social isolation uh, and loneliness. Sensory impairments. When the pandemic started, uh, there was a great push um, by all of us uh, to really look at telemedicine and virtual platforms such as this as a way to do doctor's appointments. Uh, in, in particular, let's talk about doctor's appointments. Um, telemedicine has been expanded. It used to really, from a Medicare perspective, be mostly aimed at people in rural communities. That will change. It will stay uh, more broad as it is now. But in the rush forward to um, really use telemedicine as a way to reach older people, it was clear, and, and I had an opportunity to do um, a, a couple of different workshops on this in a different setting, it was clear that one of the challenges with telemedicine or any virtual platform are sensory impairments of, by the older person, not being able to see, not being able to hear. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, nursing homes in a little bit, and that's certainly a case now if you think of um, nursing home residents um, with the assistance of, sta assistance of staff trying to connect virtually to family members, their challenges in hearing and seeing make this much, much harder than it would for people who don't have those sensory impairments. It's, it's difficult. Um, social isolation can also, and this is going back to what the report finds, um, be episodic or chronic. Uh, I went to um, a rural aging conference a year ago um, down in Tennessee, and the, there was a workshop that kind of drove me nuts, really. And they were talking about this topic, and it was a, a room full of 150 um, kind of professionals in the field of, of aging and, and health. And at one point, the, kind of the leader, um, uh, the host, asked everybody in the audience, he's like, raise your hand if you've ever been lonely. Well, 
most people at some point have been lonely. I didn't raise my hand. I thought, well, this is kind of not fair because being lonely for me right now, when I don't have these particular problems listed above, is different than having chronic loneliness or chronic social isolation that we see um, older adults experiencing. I imagine this can happen also with people with disabilities, but the, the topic here being older adults. I didn't, I didn't participate because I thought, you know, it's a bit of a setup. Um, this is a part of the human condition, but it is exacerbated for older people. Even if it's episodic or chronic, it's much more extreme. It shouldn't lightly be kind of pulled with a, a younger audience as if uh, the fact that we don't have anything to do some weekend and we feel lonely. It's not the same. Let's talk about um, the next slide, please. So what will help? And this is what we can move forward with and, and focus on a lot of the conference. Uh, we're going to talk about evidence-based programs in a slightly different context as well. There's not a lot of um, evidence-based. There's not a lot of research that's been done specifically on evidence-based programs to address social isolation. That being said, there are many of the evidence-based programs that we have that can help older people that can now be deployed in a virtual environment, understanding our need to overcome these physical challenges of making sure people can hear and see and use the technology. Uh, so there is an evidence base for aging programming um, there's not been a solid evidence base framed squarely around the issue of social isolation and loneliness. And we need more research and more best practice. And perhaps now is an opportunity to figure this out, uh, to get more attention. Uh, there's really nothing good to say about the pandemic. Uh, what those of us who kind of care about older people and, and, and work on aging policy and programs, what we need to keep in mind is this is a, a time to shine, I think, in many ways, to use um, our innovation and creativity, some of our programming, and try things in different ways. Um, because we have other people's attention in a way that's new. Uh, the fact that older people are significantly impacted in, in a way that's different than younger people is known. Uh, I'm hoping in the future it'll be easier to get the attention. Say. Uh, two years from now, one of you wants to approach a foundation to fund an evidence-based program that you want to try. Um, because of the problem of social isolation, you will be able to talk about what we're living with and seeing now, and the people on the other end of your grant application will have experienced this in the same way. AARP Foundation, on the heels of the publication of this report that they sponsored, uh, has put together an online um, tool and platform AARP Foundation Connect to Effect. And there really is the, um, how, how Emily Allen uh, will frame her discussion and go through what they are suggesting. And like I said, when we looked at the cover of that uh, report, that they were ahead of the curve and the, the timing was great. And I just uh, wanna give a shout out to Lisa Ryerson, who's the head of the foundation uh, for seeing this. Uh, she's been concerned for several years about social isolation and her investments I think will be really beneficial to all of us uh, as we help people now and move forward. Uh, let's go with the next slide. I think it might be a question. Okay, so the drop-in poll's not working. So I'm gonna pull up my chat, but I want to know from all of you, prior, I'm not gonna cover my own question. Prior to the pandemic, did you work specifically to address social isolation? Was this something that you were programming for? I'm looking through your answers and you should look through everyone else's answers. This is more of a split, a split from the earlier. Yes, all the time, Rochelle, that, that's good. No, yes. Yeah. Thank you all for dropping these in here. I don't know. It'd be interesting to guess with you all. I don't know. This is much more even than no and yeses. It looks kind of to me like almost like a 60-40 split no to yes. But it's really encouraging that so many people have been. You are now our experts and leaders. Um, yeah, it's a risk factor for depression and mental illness. 
social isolation is a huge risk factor for elder abuse as well. Um, you know, when we talk about prevention, this is, this is my, me interrupting my own comments. Um, when we talk about prevention, I think a lot of times we don't really know what it is we're preventing, but I think a transportation program is a program aimed to address social isolation, even if you've not been framing it that way. Um, a church volunteer program is a way to overcome social isolation. Um, that there's, there's, there's a way that some of you, I think, have been working clearly from your answers where you know you've been addressing social isolation. Uh, there, there also are probably some of you who have been addressing it without really even realizing um, that that's what you were doing. Um, so let's move on. Thank you for um, participating. So when I talk about social isolation by default, which is where we've come from, that this is really uh, how I'm characterizing the three plagues. Um, this is where ageism comes in. We've now designed it um, that all of us um, need to stay home and to stay safe. And this is having a major impact on older people. And I know all of us see it. And if I were in front of you in an audience, we would all raise our hand. We would all raise our hand. We're all seeing what this is doing um, to and with older people. Um, people with cognitive impairments of any age. Um, Kathy mentioned I'm um, working with the state of Kansas as a liaison, uh, LTSS liaison. I know from talking to some um, of my colleagues who work with people with disabilities, for example, they've talked about the challenges of um, working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, on something as simple as what's a serious six foot distance. You have to make sure you have to keep your mask on. When you talk to people who are providing care uh, for people in any sort of congregate setting, most especially nursing homes, but any congregate setting, that people with cognitive impairment, it's really hard for them to comprehend what's going on. Um, and, and, and people are declining uh, over a period of time. Um, it makes um, people with mental health conditions, it makes them worse uh, for people of any age. It increases depression. Um, one of you had dropped in the chat a comment about mental health. Um, it's really important to stay in touch with people, um, to provide mental health services and support. And um, it exacerbates issues like the lack of broadband access. Uh, it kind of all comes to the surface now when you force people to stay home. And it's just so staggeringly sad. I don't know how better to describe it. It's so overwhelmingly bad to understand that this is the strategy for staying safe. And it is so hard for older people. Uh, older people who feel like, uh, either perceived or in reality, they don't have that much time left. Uh, and this is, this is not how they want to spend it. They want to hug their grandkids. They want to get out. They need to be involved. Um, and they can't. And the, the awareness of the passage of time uh, with older people, I've not read or seen anything about it. It would be interesting if you all have, um, that that impact of the uh, knowledge of the, of the, the loss of time um, also, I think, makes the mental health conditions worse. Uh, and then there's also increased risk uh, for social isolation because we're forcing people to do it. And the ageism that Kathy mentioned in the opening that we have all seen uh, in, um, you know, I think our um, uh, poster boy, for lack of a better description, is Lieutenant Governor in Texas, who said he thought, old, you know, older people should just volunteer to die. Um, but it's, it's, it's formed um, that blatant and much more subtle about the dismissive nature of uh, the impact and who we're losing um, the most. Like I was um, on a briefing from the state of Kansas um, recently where 4% of the cases are older and 52% of the deaths. Uh, so the ageism um, that's impacting uh, sort of the framing and the messaging uh, is significant. And I know we all hear it. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how we use that kind of angst and anger from what we're seeing as we move forward to really challenge uh, what it says about how we value um, all of us as we age. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a little bit what I was talking about, that um, social isolation also touches on 
deep, deep fear and reality um, of dying alone. And um, we should just, can we just all shake our heads side to side that what we have seen um, and what we know is happening that we haven't seen about the people who uh, are in the hospital dying alone, who are in nursing homes dying alone, Older people know this. This is all of our greatest fear. All of us. This is not just like the older people now, but it's us now. Whatever age we are, dying alone is one of the greatest fears. Um, I think dying alone, what we really mean is dying without loved ones, uh, which is the most important thing. But I do want to give a shout out to the healthcare workers who are um, at bedside. We're with a person. Um, when I watch the news, I tell you, I was like, cry more because I'm older myself. Um, it's the stories of the healthcare workers who are facilitating that last phone call when someone goes on a vent, uh, that people are dying alone without their family and friends. Uh, there are healthcare workers uh, there trying to fill that gap. And um, they're just invaluable. And I just, I just want to acknowledge the burden that this now places on healthcare workers. Um, the other fears and reality is that the, the nature of quarantine and being separated when ill, uh, when people really most need someone to be there to take care of them, um, the social isolation that's happening in nursing homes, uh, but also happening in assisted living, independent living, any, any congregate setting, people in their homes. Um, this is just the nature of one of the greatest fears of aging, and this pulls it to the front, the loss and the loneliness and dying alone, the loss of time, the loss of family, the loss of touch. I was talking to uh, an area agency on aging director that I know pretty well, and we were talking about compassionate care visits in nursing homes and the fact that um, people need to be able to hold each other's hands. Uh, as they say goodbye. And, and what's happening right now is absolutely heartbreaking, uh, unsustainable, and really making uh, such a um, not uplifting section of my talk. Um, but this is, this is the core of, of what we're all struggling with. Next slide, please. I mentioned that I'm doing this work in the state of Kansas. I'm, I'm now uh, referring to the inability of nursing home residents to receive visitors as the new family separation. This was a policy that CMS put in place in March. Um, and it was a short-term solution for what is now a long-term problem. When CMS issued the guidance, they basically said the only people who can come in are essential workers. Um, they're in this category of non-essential workers, which um, is kind of a pejorative phrase for ancillary healthcare providers. But the way I describe this, the way I think of it, is that when the pandemic started and we started seeing all these deaths in nursing homes, we said, okay, everybody freeze. This is a common thing we do as humans. I don't know what's going on. Everybody stop. We're just going to stop, <laughs> figure this out. So stop. Family visitors, stop. And what we figured out was that the primary source of transmission in nursing homes has been from staff. Staff often work in multiple buildings or for multiple providers. Staff are doing really hands-on personal care uh, with residents. And staff, of course, live in community. The staff have been the, the most common pathway. Uh, families can, can introduce the virus, but what, what we have ended up with is a situation where we don't actually know what the family risk is because we're not letting them in. And, and, and the path that we're on, I think, is not sustainable. Residents have rights to visitors. I think we need to uh, find our way out of the total ban on family visitors by focusing on what's the risk that's actually presented. Uh, and what's like, I always think of like the old guy visiting his wife every day. What is the risk that, that he presents? Um, nursing homes around the country are now receiving rapid testing machines. They are going to have problems getting supplies. But watch this issue over the next 60 to 90 days, uh, because as we can do point of care testing and find out what is the actual risk presented, can I screen you? Do you have the virus? It'll make it easier to come back and revisit 
this federal policy of not allowing visitors. This is not a good place to be. Uh, very few people think it is. And nursing home residents uh, need families. Family visitors are essential. Some states have really kind of pushed um, their authority in this issue as far as they can by suggesting that nursing home residents could designate an essential caregiver who can come in. <clears throat> but this separation and forced isolation uh, of nursing home residents to me right now is kind of the tip of the spear in witnessing uh, what, what we're doing to people with our policies. They're coming from a place, the policies come from a place of significant fear about what's happening. And I just want to acknowledge, I know how many people are dying in nursing homes, but would we have put the same policy in place in March if we'd known it was an 18 month policy? That we have to now acknowledge this is a long-term problem, not a short-term. And we, we have to come back to attending to this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the um, disparate impact that the coronavirus is having based on race and ethnicity. And, ethnicity. Um, and I found um, a racial data tracker online which is really interesting. Um, it's a project, like I say here, of the Atlantic and Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Uh, black people are dying 2.4 times the rate of white people. Um, the deaths of black people account for like 22% of the deaths. Uh, American Indian, Hispanic, Latino death rates are higher than white, um, white people. This particular resource is interesting because it tracks data by state. I know I've looked at Kansas data where the, the prevalence uh, of, of the, the rates of death um, of people of color is, is higher than uh, the rate of um, people of color in the general population. Uh, this certainly applies uh, in our field of work to older people. If you look at the deaths in nursing homes, it really jumps off the page that many of the deaths in nursing homes are from people of color, uh, that, that we have to know that now, name that now, and I think in the future, uh, sort of re redouble our efforts or however you describe sort of strengthening our commitment to the structural problems that are underlying this. Um, some of the, the deaths, I think, in nursing homes reflect um, an intersection of um, prevalence of Medicaid, the insufficiency of Medicaid payments, and people of color in, in high Medicaid homes. That's not universally true, but we need to know more about why. Um, next page, please. Next slide. Um, when I look at the news uh, and, and all the headlines, I think they're all from, I think they're all the same headline that, um, that I, I think, Kathy's editorial comment, that the impacts of the pandemic and the social unrest and the impact on people of color uh, reflect structural problems. There are structural problems in our field as well with regard to discrimination. Um, the social determinants of health that impact um, older people that are cumulative at, at that point, a lifetime of poverty, a lifetime of access to healthcare. When I was assistant secretary, um, I did some work and some presentations on what it means to be uninsured and then go on Medicare. Because we all know of people who like hang on until they can become qualified for Medicare. People who have not had health insurance who now qualify for Medicare are the most expensive people to early sign up for Medicare because they've had a lifetime of lack of insurance. The problems with lack of access to healthcare utilization, um, the historic discrimination and stigma that make um, Healthcare access, vaccination, really kind of suspicious for some people of color because of the, of the history um, uh, of what's happened to them. So, you know, this is, this is a page, we could like pull this, tear this off, it's like, this is our work. Um, occupation, uh, that many people of color are in jobs that we consider essential, essential low-wage low workers, um, the frontline workers, people at the grocery store, um, people who don't have the luxury of sitting in their nice home, like me. Um, people who have to be out on the front lines to make a living um, can also skew towards um, people of color. Housing, you know, I have been concerned about senior high rises, low income hut housings. They really fall off the radar screen at the state level because they're really a federal program that a state aging department doesn't really intersect with. Um, this can Im impact people of color. And the, the intersection with poverty, um, I'm certainly not saying all people of color are poor, but there is an intersection between 
um, poverty and race uh, that's showing up, I think, as we look at the data uh, of people who are dying and getting sick. Um, next slide. So I want to know now, I've got another question, then I think I've got just a couple slides to wrap up. Does your current work on social isolation, how does it compare? What, what has the pandemic done with you all? Are you focused more now, the same, or have you changed at all? Because we're all living with social isolation in a different way. And when I, I wanna know um, what you're all seeing. So if you all are doing, I guess at this point, if you'll drop that into the chat so we can all kind of scroll through. Increase, are you doing more? Increased? Yeah, modest. Thank you all for sticking with me and participating this way. Huge increase, yeah. That it really has re reshuffled for some of us, uh, our impact. Um, it's interesting because there's probably a correlation for those of you who are doing direct service between not having any other way, way to provide the programming that we really have um, to focus on social isolation. All right, I've got a last couple of slides and I'm gonna leave some time so we can ask some questions. So let's do, thank you all for, that's my third question. Thank you for dropping into the chat. Um, so I think the priorities right now are both connection and reconnection. I think that shows up um, in, in what you all are um, describing in the chat, those of you who can talk a little bit more about what you're doing, that virtual visits are helpful, but they're not sufficient. Um, I think we all, we all know that. I mean, they fill a needed gap. They are a useful tool. There's an evidence base behind them. There are some challenges, and they are not a substitute for human contact, as we all know, because we'd rather be at the Kauffman Center today that virtual is just not quite as good. Uh, we need to focus on trauma and resilience, uh, how we help people move through this, how we identify um, crisis, mental health crisis, failure, both physical and mental decline. Uh, we need to deal with <laughs> what we do about how you reach someone who really can't hear. You know, how do we make this connection? Um, I have been advocating for additional outdoor visits um, between uh, nursing home residents and staff. So the rules for outdoor visit is you have to be six feet apart, you both have to wear a mask, and so can you hear each other if you're both wearing a mask. I mean, it's going to be very hard uh, for people at that distance with masks to hear each other, whether the visitor um, or the resident has a hearing impairment. And uh, facilities, I heard of one needing to use something like a, a baby monitor or a, some sort of um, amplified sound to be able to accomplish a socially distant visit because of the, the barriers with, with hearing loss. Uh, I think, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know as much right now about the vision loss barriers. Uh, it certainly could impact the programming if we're relying on people being able to kind of see and interact. Um, that we need to find a way to do in-person visits and safe visits. Um, I've seen some creative things, um, drive-by parades, um, drive-in events where everyone stays in their cars, um, driveway visits. Uh, there's a lot of value in finding a way to do something in person that's also safe. Uh, next slide, please. So here's some ideas. I kind of looked around at some of the resources that are out there right now. Um, telephone reassurance is something that the aging network and aging um, providers, people in this space, have been doing for a long time. Uh, I'm a big believer in using faith communities to help maintain connection with older parishioners and just calling, calling and calling. Um, how are you doing? What do you need? Um, it would be far better that they had a friend that they trust than a telemarketer or the current social security scams going around. Call. Um, virtual visits, like we've talked about, virtual programming, uh, some of the things like Aging Mastery that Mark has offered, um, drive-through meals. I, I read one example where since um, senior centers can't offer congregate settings, congregate meals um, at this point, they do drive-through meals. Uh, and that's, that's a good um, idea for a senior center. It's like, just come by. Uh, we'll hand it to you through the window. Uh, Drive-up concerts. 
letters and cards. Uh, I think this is something that communities could do to adopt um, the members uh, or the residents in a, in a local nursing home. Um, don't forget letters and cards. I saw some people um, that were using robotic pets as a way uh, to provide company uh, that, you know, people are being really creative. On the next slide, I have a list of some resources um, that I started looking around for what are people doing. Advancing States, which is the association that represents state departments on aging and disability, has a good guide online uh, where they have really gathered information from their member states. Um, we've mentioned AERP Foundation, National Association of Area Agency on Aging has ideas. Um, ACL, my former agency, has ideas. Alzheimer's Association, of course, then we can talk more specifically about programming for people with Alzheimer's and related dementias. And the National Council on Aging. Our national leading organizations in the field of aging can be helpful to us uh, in, in thinking about what would be helpful and what's creative that might work for uh, any of us, depending on kind of where you're working, uh, what kind of work you're doing. So I think that is it i think there i am that's how you can email me um at my little um my little business and um thank you all thank you for participating sticking in answering the questions and kathy did we see anything in the chat or certainly people can ask questions now um, yes well first thank you kathy you uh, and i think i speak for everyone and it's unfortunate we can't see everyone's face um but you you have really started this um this new um, virtual age positive 2020 revision and just a, a comprehensive inspiring informative um, you were the perfect person to to um, kick off this session so thank you so much i've i've had the opportunity since kathy th this region the kansas city region has benefited from kathy choosing to make this her home at least hopefully for the for the next few years and so kathy you have such a great way of of talking at the policy level but also touching our hearts because you share your heart and you certainly did during this keynote so thank you um i've been kind of monitoring questions and i i don't think i've seen a question yet uh, so i'll keep monitoring but um so one question that i will ask you many of the people who are registered for age positive revision attended a, a nonprofit advocacy training uh, a few months ago. So what would be your recommendation for those that are in the nonprofit field or those that um, Parks and Rec, others that, that care deeply about older adults? What's an advocacy uh, activity or effort that you would recommend that we could do individually or for our organizations? So for me, um, when you talk about advocacy, the target for the advocacy is often um, an, an official or a policymaker or a funder, someone who's had roles like me, someone who's been in a foundation. Uh, I think it's really important to bring forward um, stories. I think, I think data is important. I, 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 you know, whatever we can find, like that's why I think this, this National Academy's report is helpful because it gives us a, a data uh, source to go back to, but also to bring forward stories. I've talked to a lot of older people um, in my career and um, I think what's missing the most in the field writ large is older people um, advocating for themselves. Um, I think um, AARP through their statewide chapters can do a good job of helping coordinate, but they're not the, not the only ones, but bringing the voices of older people into the conversation. And to me, I think the hardest thing that I've ever asked an older person to do is talk about what they're struggling with is all of us uh, are proud that if, if we want more money for family caregivers, and I would be the policy person who would come in and say, we gotta have more money for Older Americans Act family caregivers. It would be most helpful if whoever is listening to me has heard from a family caregiver who just can't do it anymore. That, that often um, our advocacy efforts are meant to address a problem that we've identified and, and our efforts will be more successful as advocates if the problem has already been presented by a real person in that other person's life. Um, that, that I can be a validator, but I, as a policymaker, should never have been the first person to raise an issue. Um, and I, I can give you, I, mean, I, I know this firsthand experience from being in Washington. If I went on the Hill and said, we need more money because older people are hungry, 
then I need the member of Congress to go, oh yeah, I've heard that at home. So advocacy needs to be taking data, but also really presenting the struggles, um, as well as then, I, I don't wanna over, over um, look um, the opportunities, which is look, we, we've got a great program, Aging Mastery or an evidence-based exercise program. We could do more of this. Um, here's some great people who say it helps. Um, we need funding to do it. So I think, Kathy, it's about making it first person. Um, and when I left, as one of the last things I did when I was Secretary of Aging in Kansas, um, my last session, uh, because we were having some budget struggles, is I really implored the Area Agency on Aging Directors in Kansas to bring older people to the Capitol. Uh, AERP does that, but I needed people there when we were talking about the budget. So we, we, we got to round up more um, older people to advocate for themselves, for ourselves uh, on these programs. Great, thank you. Um, we're starting to run out of time. So I, I don't think we have more questions to pose okay. to you, but there have been a couple of questions. So um, in a little bit, people are gonna be put into a waiting room. So um, perhaps people can chat what they would have for their responses. One question is, what are we gonna do when the weather impacts uh, people's ability to meet outside? or in some of the, the scenarios that, that you um, describe. So that might be one question that we can chat back and forth together. And then what is, what is being done to overcome the problem of sensory impairment challenges in dealing with telemedicine? So I, do you have like a 30, 40 second response to that? Uh, I don't know on the second one, uh, in terms of telemedicine, what's being used to overcome it. It may take facilitation, um, that it can't be just, um, um, one person on the other end, if they if they really need some help um, to to overcome a sensory um, challenge, it may take another person. On the outdoor visits, um, we're having a lot of conversation, me and my colleagues at the state, about helping nursing homes and other congregate settings uh, create areas where people can stay warm. Um, outdoor virtual visits, in tents with heaters. Um, you know, how do we, or even like the front lobby? I mean, we will have to create a way to overcome um, the weather uh, and build places. And um, I won't assume that we have all of those in place now, but we must have in-person visits in some way. And if they have to be semi-outdoors, then that's what we'll need to do uh, and find a way to help, um, help people put those together. Thank you all for participating this morning. Yes, and so finally, once again, to thank you, Kathy, and then thank everybody who is on or attended this session. We hope that you're able to stick with us to attend the next session, Combating Social Isolation in, in Your Community with Emily Allen with the AARP Foundation. Uh, look for an email immediately following this session with a link to a participant evaluation. Um, we really do want your feedback um, to help make virtual programs um, improve upon those. And we do hope that you'll join us and continue on. Um, you will be, Carmelia is going to put you now into a waiting room and uh, we'll let you re-enter in at about 10 after 10 because Emily's uh, presentation will begin uh, immediately at 10.15. So thanks again. And at some point, we're all gonna be moved to a waiting room. Thank you all.